Hi class, welcome to Illustrator Lab 6. Today we are going to introduce swatches. We're going to explore the pattern editor, uh, grid tiles, brick tiles, and hex tiles. We're also going to review some new kind of ways to use the rotate and scale tools, as well as the move tool, and we'll introduce you to the recolor tool. The file you're going to need today is called patterntool.ai. When you're ready, go ahead and launch it. All right, today's lecture has two parts. Part one, swatches, tiles, and pattern editing. And part two, pattern creation. The most important thing about today, the very first thing I want you to do is I want you to get the swatches window. All right, some of you might have had it open before, so it might exist in your uh, program. But if you hadn't, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to uh, close mine, and I'm going to reopen one to show you where to get it. So you're going to come up here to window, and then from the drop down menu, all the way down to swatches. Now Swatches is where Illustrator stores uh, very specific color information. It's got a bunch of defaults in here for you, um, a couple gradients as well. Um, if you're in the publishing or printing business, you can use this to store very specific Pantones. Um, it can be very useful in that way. You can also folder these. if You've got very specific graphic design projects with very specific uh, colors. Um, it is also where Illustrator allows us to house patterns. All right. Um, We've got two layers that we're working with today, just as an aside. We have a template layer, which has all of our instructions on it, and then our vector object layer. Just make sure that you are working on that vector object layer. When you're ready, let's go ahead and zoom in to this very first part. Let's switch my swatches down here. Oh, never mind, it wants to marry them. That's fine. All right, so our very first job is to drag each set of the following shapes into the swatches window, A, B, and C. All right, group A has four blue squares. We have two dark blue and two light blue or cyan. So it's four objects and they're in a group. So we're just gonna click. We're gonna do exactly what it says. We're gonna drag this set of objects into the swatches window. Now when my cursor crosses over into the swatches window, it's gonna kind of become highlighted, that little blue highlight. And my cursor is gonna have that little plus sign next to it if I hover over kind of a blank space. Where I let go of my click, I will get a brand new swatch. This is my pattern. I've just created a pattern. All right, it looks like a miniature of what I just dragged in. All right, let's do that with group B and C and then we'll move on. So group B has uh, five shapes. It's got one dark blue square and four light blue squares and each of the light blues um, has a 50% opacity. So as they cross over each other, they get a little bit more opaque, kind of uh, creates the illusion of plaid or tartan. Grab all of B and drag that into our swatches palette. Then C only has two objects, just a blue square and a light blue circle. So it doesn't really matter how many objects you have selected when you bring them into your swatches palette. It will make a pattern out of whatever it is that you drag. All right, next, it says to fill the objects below with the assigned pattern swatch. Then rotator scale is directed. So our first object is this Kind of Saturn-like planet. It's got a ring around it. It is just a single object. It is um, a compound path, so it has an outside and an inside. At some point, uh, like a minus front pathfinder tool was used on it. Maybe even a uh, unite. Either way, we just have one object here, and if we have this selected, right now it's fill is gray, just a, a color. But if we click on our first pattern, which we created with that set of uh, squares from A, it will fill our object with the pattern. Now the advantage of this is that um, A, we don't need to cut up a bunch of squares and use a Pathfinder tool to fill this with squares. Um, also, if you make any changes to the pattern, it will automatically update any fills that use it. All right, so our first task now is to rotate 20 degrees. Now we're not rotating the object, we're not rotating the planet, we just wanna rotate the pattern inside of it. So in order to do this, we're not gonna use our bounding box and we're not gonna hit R for rotate because that will grab the object as well. Instead, we're gonna double click on our rotate tool over here on our toolbar. And we have a couple things to decide. First of all, the angle of change. So we want that to be 20 degrees. Next, we want to deselect here where it says to transform the object. So the only checkbox is transform patterns. We want to 
rotate our pattern 20 degrees without moving the paths of the object. Now if we deselect and reselect the preview, you can kind of see that happening live. We don't hit OK. Awesome, first step done. Our next object, I'm going to select it with hotkey V. It's the moon shape, planet, moon, and we'll go star. We're going to fill this with the pattern swatch from B, all right, so that plaid or tartan. All right, as soon as you click that in your swatches palette, it will have populated that into your fill. Now, if your stroke was forward when you clicked on it, it might have actually filled your stroke with a pattern instead. So make sure that it was your fill that was forward first. All right, next, this is asking us to scale the pattern 50%. So below our Rotate tool in our toolbar, we can double click on our Scale tool. And this one will have a bunch of options as well. Uniform, scaling, non-uniform scaling. If it's non-uniform, we can decide on our vertical and horizontal. Um, let's make sure that we are scaling this in a uniform way so our height and width ratio doesn't change. Type in 50%. And then again, just like the pattern editing tool, we can transform the object or we can just transform the pattern. So depending on which boxes you have selected, you are telling Illustrator what it is you are trying to scale. So we're not trying to scale the object, so make sure that one's deselected. We are trying to scale the pattern. And you can hit Preview a couple times, make sure you like those changes, and then hit OK. Now we see that pattern happening a few more times because this is really large, and it covers most of the space of the object. Sometimes you want that pattern to be smaller so you can see a little bit more of it. All right, next one, the star shape. We're gonna fill it with pattern C, that dot. So we're gonna click on our swatches where we drag that in. And this one wants us to both rotate it 45 degrees and scale it 20%. So let's do that. Let's double click on rotate, select 45 degrees. Make sure that transform object is not selected. And double click on scale. And scale that, what was it, 20%. Remember, uniform, we want the height and width to remain the same ratio. And then we're not trying to transform the object, we're just trying to transform the pattern. When you're done, hit OK. So it's like a cute little grid of polka dots. All right, so all three of these patterns that we dragged, as soon as we released them into the pattern, uh, excuse me, into the swatches palette, um, they loaded under some default settings. All right. The default setting was that their tile was a grid type, which meant that the objects would be laid in rows and columns that are organized by a grid. We're going to move on to this next set of patterns and shapes, and we're going to kind of expand on that. Instead of keeping to just the default grid, we're going to try brick by row. So we're going to drag the following groups of shapes into the swatches window. We're going to double click the swatches to edit them. We're going to change the pattern's tile type from grid to brick by row, and we're going to adjust the tile dimensions. So our very first set of patterns here, step D, and select those, and drag them into our pattern editor. And just because I'm right here, I might as well do it to the others as well. So the two objects for step E and the two objects for step F. All right, I'm gonna make sure that I've deselected these objects because if it, these objects were selected the next time that I touched any of these uh, swatches of the patterns, it would actually fill them with that pattern and I don't wanna do that. So make sure that nothing is selected right now. And let's go in and edit our pattern. In order to do this, all you have to do is double click on the swatch. All right, and you'll have entered our pattern editing tool. All right, you'll notice we have kind of like a uh, interesting highlighted area of our program. We also have this new box that appeared, pattern options. And we have a couple of different um, kind of exit routes over here. We have save a copy, done, and cancel. We can also always just go back to our file. All right. What's happening here is a preview of 
the objects that you dragged into the swatches palette. So that's those two squares right there, the dark blue square and the light blue square. And then a grid of previewed repeats. So this is how this pattern would look if it got an, if we had a bigger shape. It would just look like this. Um, let's talk about all these pieces. So these are the pieces of vector information that we want to build the pattern with. All right. So you can name this D. So this is pattern D in our swatches palette. And this is what those uh, instructions were talking about earlier when they said to change the tile type from grid to brick by row. All right, so now instead our tile, which is this box here, it looks kind of like a canvas, this small box here, instead of repeating as a grid just vertically and just horizontally, is repeating with a slight horizontal change each time. Now that change is called an offset. It's called a brick offset. So if you were laying actual bricks, how far off of one brick do you move up the next one? So in this case, it's half. Let's change this to two fifths. So this offset can be changed from the default half, any of these drop down numbers. And then you see instead of getting a grid, we have a nice kind of what looks like brickwork. All right. The preview around our pattern, this is those, this is what we were talking about earlier, those copies. All right, so you can decide if you'd like to see more copies or fewer copies around your original shapes and your tile that create the pattern. So you can change this to be nine by nine. You can change this all the way just so you only want to see your only one. I'm not smart enough to predict what that's going to look like, so I actually do need at least a few on each side. Um, you can also change how far you dim the copies. If you don't want to see them as strong as 50%, you can push those back a little bit. Or maybe you're the kind of person who needs to visualize them at 100%. It doesn't matter but know that you have the power to change that. All right, now show tile edge. If you go ahead and toggle that on and off, you're gonna notice that that little um, line, kind of like our canvas, um, is going to disappear or reappear. So that is your tile. Your tile has dimensions. It has a height and a width. And if you would like to, you can always change those. Right now they are linked, which means if I change one, it will proportionally change the other. Um, I like to change my things by sight. So I'm going to just set my cursor inside uh, this dialog box. And then if I use my scroll wheel, I can change the width just by scrolling instead of having to type in values. I do a lot of things by sight. So Now you'll notice that our width and height of the tile were changing at the same time. And as soon as I got too wide or too tall, we started seeing the gaps between the repeats. That's because our shape, our cyan shape doesn't make it even to the end of the tile. So there's going to be space between every repeat. So if you look at little hairline spaces, it's because your object isn't taking up the entire tile. You can go ahead and shrink that back. Now, if you wanted to change these independently, you could just deselect that little link icon. And now you could change the height. I'm doing the scroll wheel again, independently of the width and vice versa. All right, so once you have changed it to brick by row and an offset of two fifths, what we're gonna do is we're gonna come up here and click done. We don't really need to save a copy because the original wasn't what we were after anyways. However, if you were doing a lot of pattern making and you may have to go back to your original idea, then at this point you could save a copy. But for us, we're just gonna hit done. All right. So that was D pattern offset by two fifths. Let's go to E. So our E pattern, our offset is one third. All right, we're gonna double click, make sure you don't have any objects selected again, because we're just gonna go edit the pattern, not edit any objects. We're gonna double click on that pattern there. All right, so what appeared to just be a very kind of boring circle or part of a circle cut by a square actually turns into a pretty cool wave pattern. Here we'll change it from grid 
to brick by row. So it staggers them like they are bricks. And we'll call this B. And then for me, I kind of want to change the height of my tile a little bit so the waves are a little bit closer to each other. So I'm going to go to my height. And I'm going to go ahead and click in that dialog box and then use my scroll wheel to reduce the height. Now, if I do it too far, what's going to happen is my blue, my dark blue square is actually going to cut into one of the copies and then I'll get that awful kind of a scaled or scalloped look. So I got to make sure not to go too far or I've got to make sure to use a thinner box. Go ahead and reduce the size of your tile. And hit done. All right, in pattern F, we have an offset of one half. All right, so again, make sure nothing is selected. And double click on the swatch that we dragged in here for pattern F. We have some changes to make here. We have a lot of changes to make here. Um, let's first call this F. We'll change it from grid to brick by row. And just by the way, brick by column is the same thing. It just is acting vertically instead of horizontally. So we won't do a brick by column pattern, but just know that it's basically the same thing as rotated 90 degrees. All right, once we have our brick by row and our brick offset, I don't recall what the brick offset was supposed to be now. I'm gonna have to go back. All right, done. Oh, it was one half. Oh, we forgot to set, it was E to one third. Okay, everybody, follow me. We're gonna do this lemming style, E. Double click on that pattern, change it to one third, and hit done. <laughs> we'll go back to pattern F. <laughs> we'll change that to one half. Great. Okay, we're doing it, we're good. Um, the next thing I want is for my tile to give me some empty space between the tips of this kind of almondy eyeball shape. So my tile needs to be wider. I'm going to go ahead and put my cursor inside this dialog box and use my scroll wheel to add some space. Next, I want the vertical, the height of this tile to be much shorter so that each of these shapes is much, much more snug to the other. I'm going to go ahead and just put that cursor in here and use my scroll wheel to snuggle them up. Once they are much closer, so part of my shape is going above and below my tile, but that's okay because Illustrator knows to still repeat that. We need to get this background square, this background rectangle, to fill up the whole background. I didn't want it to look like this. This, this is not what I had pictured. So I'm going to move my rectangle here to the side, and then I'm going to stretch it. So I'm moving it and stretching it using my regular old Illustrator tool. So I'm just using my selection tool hotkey V to do this. I can change anything about a shape while in this pattern editing tool. They're not locked in. All right, once I've made it the approximate height and width of the tile, you notice I'm still having like that awful scaling problem. Now this has to do with how a copy has to, uh, how tiles have to overlap each other. Um, you'll notice here in our little icons that the left must overlap the right, and the top must overlap the bottom. So in order to get around this, we're actually gonna scoot this rectangle to the left and above until it no longer covers the next object below it. All right. I'm sure there's a really good reason for this and it has to do um, with the programming. All I know is that that's how you gotta get around it. Now you can change the way that these overlap. So if you need to move objects in a different way, you can go ahead and reselect that your uh, right overlaps to the left or the bottom overlaps the top, etc. Let's go ahead and scooch that rectangle until it no longer cuts into those. And we will hit done. All right, so we changed all those tile types from grid to brick by row. We changed their offset. And then we also adjusted the tile dimensions. So our next step is to fill these fun shapes with those patterns that we just created and then do any editing left over in our instructions. So 
our cloud. We have two pieces of cloud. Let's go ahead and select them both. So we're going to fill them with pattern D, the bricks. All right. Our next step is that we need to adjust the right half using recolor artwork. This is a tool we have not used before in this class. So it's okay if you're like, I have no idea what it means. This is what the icon looks like, and it will appear in your control bar once you have an object selected. So let's go ahead and select the right side of that cloud. And then way up here in your control bar, you'll see this icon, this recolor artwork icon. If you do not right now have a control bar, get that by clicking on window and control. All right, so with that right half selected, let's go ahead and click recolor artwork. This is gonna bring us to a box that allows us to change colors all at the same time in relationship to each other. So instead of changing fills or instead of going into our pattern and changing the pieces of our pattern, we can change a lot at once. Now, I don't normally work out of this um, assign tab. I usually work out of the edit tab. All right. Now in the edit tab, it's gonna have this fun little target that will show you where your colors exist on the color wheel. They are linked by default when you open this tool, which means if I decide to change the hue, saturation, or brightness, that's what H, S, and B stand for, they will stay locked. Their relationship to each other will remain intact. So I can change that hue, that saturation, and the brightness. I'm gonna go ahead for some green tiles. All right, at this point, I love the color of the brick. I don't love the color of what we're gonna call the mortar, the stuff in between, that kind of lime, that light yellow. Um, I think it could be just like a little bit brighter. So in order to change just that color and not both of them because they're linked, I'm gonna deselect the link icon. Then I'm gonna click on just this one color. So I've got both of the colors I have selected up here. I'm just gonna make sure that I've selected just my lighter color. I'm going to push that further towards yellow and maybe increase the brightness. All right, so in that way, I can more independently adjust them if their ratio wasn't good. It was good for the blue, but it wasn't good once we got over into the yellow area. Now, if I'm unsure about my changes, again, I can always deselect and reselect this kind of preview button, so recolor art or not. And if you ever go too far, and you're like, oh, I need to start over with blues, and you don't want to cancel out of your dialog box, you can always hit reset, and it will give you the original colors that you started with. All right, I don't want to do that because I really like what happened here. So I'm gonna hit okay. All right, something magical just happened, but you didn't see it because you're busy looking at these really bright bricks. A new pattern appeared in our swatches palette. All right, because we changed an existing pattern, and the information still contained in this shape is a pattern, but did not exist prior to our recolor. It gave us a new swatch with our new green brick pattern in it. All right, so anytime you edit a pattern in that way, not in the pattern editing tool, it will give you an additional swatch that includes those changes. Okay, so for pattern E, let's move on. So we've got a water drop shape. We're gonna go ahead and fill it with that fun wave pattern. Now something's gonna happen here on your screen and on my screen, um, depending on uh, the quality of the video, you might not be able to see it as well on my screen as you will on yours. So I want you to take a look at the seam of where that water comes to the little crest. Do you see that there's like a, like almost like a teeny tiny hairline fracture between the tiles? All right, this isn't something that you did wrong. This is kind of a previewing error that Illustrator has when objects meet exactly in the same mathematical location. All right, so the sides of our, this object up here, so the sides of this object and this object meeting in the exact same mathematical location is giving us just a slight visual error. There's gonna be a way around this. So I want you to, you can keep your object selected at this point, but let's go back into our pattern editor, double click on that pattern. And I want you to zoom in to the right edge of this cute little water shape, this little wave. 
Now we're going to use our uh, anchor point tool to create handlebars on this side of our path. So with Shift C selected, I'm going to pull that out. And now what happens is my two paths, so the path on the right has a curve and the path on the left is still straight. And so they no longer share the same mathematical location. All right, so this one kind of bleeds over into that one. You, what you don't want is your pattern to bump out or anything strange because it will do that on the rest of its repeat. So go ahead and make sure that wherever you pulled those handlebars as it curved out of the tile, that they still stay within the wave shape. And then let's hit done. And then what should happen is we don't have that funny uh, display problem anymore. Okay, so now let's actually do what we're supposed to, which is the load pattern into stroke. All right, so with our object selected, we have two options. We can either click on uh, our swatch while our stroke is forward, or we can simply click on our fill in our toolbar and drag that into our stroke. All right, it won't look like much has happened because it's probably a one point stroke, but let's increase the width of that using our stroke tool and notice that our pattern continues from our fill into our stroke. So you can have pattern and stroke and there are some very specific ways that it becomes useful. Um, just remember that if you do it by accident and you're not sure why your fill didn't uh, populate with a pattern, it's probably because you accidentally put it in your stroke instead. And you can always change those back to a regular solid fill or no fill, etc. Solid stroke or no stroke, etc. Okay, heart shape with our fun little scale pattern, pattern F. So select your heart, click on that swatch. Ah, look what I did, I put it in my stroke because my stroke was forward. I told you you'd do that. I didn't tell you that I would do it, but I told you you might. All right, let's make sure my fill is forward and then I will hit that again. All right, so this pattern has now filled inside my shape. Now, I'm being asked to center the pattern using the move tool. The move tool, um, also known as your selection tool, that black arrow key, if we move our heart, it's going to move both the heart and the pattern inside of it. So this is a lot like when we rotated and scaled the patterns earlier in that we're gonna double click on this tool, double click, and we'll get our little move dialog box. Now we can move it horizontally or vertically. We can define a distance and an angle. Um, we wanna make sure that we're not transforming the object, we're just transforming the pattern. Now on the horizontal, our goal right now is to center this kind of shape, this the nice like almond shape with the center of the heart. So I need to move this horizontal. So I'm gonna put my cursor in here, I'm gonna use my scroll wheel, I'm gonna scroll until it's nice and centered visually. Vertically, if I had maybe like a small gap up at the top that I didn't uh, particularly enjoy, or if I had a very um, particular place that I wanted this middle one to be, I could do that scrolling vertically. More or less, I'm just uh, concerned about the horizontal. When you're done, go ahead and hit OK. All right, so aside from being able to edit the pattern um, inside the pattern editing tool, you can do a lot of editing to it as part of the shape. You can rotate, scale, move, you can recolor, etc. All right, so step three of part one, we're going to learn about another tile type called hex by column or hex by row. Do the same thing as we started with, we're gonna drag the following groups of shapes into the swatches window. And we're gonna double click the swatch to edit it. All right, so group G, drag that into the swatches window. We'll do so with H as well. And with I. Now something I want you to pause and notice really quick is that G is a lot like what we've already been doing. It's just solid shapes. We have three shapes here. Light blue, medium blue, dark blue. In H, we have groups, we have little fish in groups, and we have both a gradient, so the fill of the fish's main shape is a gradient from light blue to medium blue, 
and then we also have shadows that are the dark blue with a transparency. So the plaid had some transparency too, so this isn't as big of a surprise, but the gradient is new, having a gradient inside a pattern. All right, and then this third option, I, this is the first time we've used stroke inside of a pattern. All right, so you can have both gradient stroke and transparency inside a pattern. All right, now we're gonna go into our pattern editing tool. Let's go ahead and double click on our first one, our pattern G. Let's go ahead and name it real quick. We're gonna change it from grid to hex by column. All right, now the lovely thing about this is that I already created the shapes in hexag uh, hexagonal shape. So the tile is already the perfect size. It's perfectly snug around all the edges. This won't always happen. And in the next few examples, you'll find that out very quickly. So this is all we're going to do. Oh, I should maybe capitalize that because I've been capitalizing the other ones. All right. And when you're done, go ahead and say so with a nice click on done. All right. In our fish pattern, let's double click on that one and let's get talking about patterns that are a little more scattered. So up until this point, almost everything has been very geometric shapes. This is the first time we had some organic shapes. So we're gonna go from, let's see, we're gonna name it H. We'll go from grid to hex by column. All right, now the hexagon tile was loaded as the same height and width of the art that we had selected. So that group of fish was a certain height and a certain width, and so that's the size of our tile. That's why it came in a little bit more squashed than the other hexagon tile did. We can go ahead and scroll and give ourselves a little more width. I would like to give myself an awful lot more height. Because what I want to kind of create is a pattern that repeats and looks like a very uh, scattered school of fish. So there'll be some dense areas and some lighter areas. And I'm gonna zoom out here. I don't want some of these uh, gaps to be as predictable as they feel as I see my copies repeating around. So I'm gonna start by actually giving myself a couple more fish in here. I'm gonna use my group selection tool, Shift A, to get that direct selection tool with the group selection modifier. So we did that in one of our first labs. And I'm gonna select the group that is this tiniest fish. I'm gonna give myself a copy, Command C, Command F. I'm going to drag that fish up this way. And I'm going to duplicate that fish by holding down Option and clicking and, oops, there are widgets turned on. Option and clicking and dragging to give myself a copy. And I'm going to go ahead and hit hotkey V so I can make that one smaller while holding down Shift to keep those proportions together. I'm going to give myself a little smaller fish. I'm gonna have it overlap this big fish's tail. There's something wonderful about being able to overlap and not worrying about it, because they're supposed to. Duplicate that fish one more time so I have two small fish. Maybe this one is slightly behind one of our larger fish as well. All right, so I get this nice scattered, natural feeling placement of these animals. When you're done, go ahead and hit done. All right, group I, the fun little noodle paths. I'll double click on that pattern swatch that we dragged in. We'll change this one to be, this one will be hex by column, this one will be hex by row. And again, we have that rule about how objects will overlap each other. So we'll have to grab that background hexagon and move it uh, to the left and upward so that it doesn't overlap some of these objects below it. Well, lucky for us, our tile size came in at just about right. If yours came in with any kind of gap in, if you accidentally uh, resized something before you dragged it into the pattern swatch, you can always, always adjust them.
It's not a very natural shape, not a uh, mechanical, man-made, geometric shapes. So this pattern feels very whimsical and silly. Getting it done. Now that we've made those three swatches, let's go ahead and fill our shapes, our three boxes here, with those patterns. So first box with G. So that was the pattern of our fun little hex cubes. All right, now we're gonna use widgets to round the top corners. So with hotkey A, we're gonna select our upper left, hold down shift in our upper right corners, and we'll just round those all the way down. So we have a nice little archway. On our next box, we need our fish pattern H. And then it says to lower the opacity to 50%. So we'll go to our transparency window. If you don't have that, again, you can get that through the drop down window in transparency. And we'll change that opacity to 50%. So patterns are constrained by all the same shape making tools, so widgets, paths, etc., um, as the objects that they fill. They also can have transparency opacity. They can have a blending mode. None of these will look very cool because there's nothing behind it for it to blend with, but they can also have a blending mode. All right, now this next one, it says we're going to duplicate this shape and I drop this gradient. So first we're gonna fill this shape with our noodle pattern. And then we're gonna duplicate the shape, Command C, Command F. If you're on a PC, that's Control C and Control F. And then we're going to use eyedropper, hotkey I, and I drop this gradient. Now this gradient goes from dark blue to transparent and back to dark blue with a multiply blending mode. That's why it kind of looks like almost like it's turning around a surface. It's adding shadow over the left and right side. Right. So we can see through some objects into our patterns. So we do the same thing with this one, Command C, Command F. We can eye drop a pattern again. There's lots of really fun things you can do, just how creatively you layer them or blend them or work them into your illustration is up to you. Now as an added bonus on this fish pattern, let's pretend that you needed these fish only to come up to a certain point in an illustration. All right, so instead of coming up to the end of a box, they needed to come up to um, a line that's kind of in the middle, but you can't use a straight line because then you end up with like the tails of some fish. So in this case, we can go ahead and bring our path down and we can create by using our plus key, so we can add anchor points, we can create a very custom shape to exclude some fish from being visible. So I'm using my plus key and then my a to move the path or move the anchor points. So it's not that we've deleted any fish, we're not masking yet. What we're doing is we're just saying that the shape doesn't really include the space it would take to see those other fish. So we have a nice fun top of it where we don't see a bunch of fish tails and bellies cutting through. So the shape that you Put your pattern in can matter. You can do very custom. Okay, so we have now graduated from part one, which is where we learned kind of the tiles, um, the different tile types, how to manipulate our patterns, into our part two, which is pattern creation. So we're going to create three patterns from scratch. All right, and they're going to look like these. These are just a PNG, so we unfortunately can't eye drop them. They're not already in our swatches palette. We're going to have to make them ourselves. They are the three types. We have a grid, a brick by row, and a hexagonal pattern. We're going to recreate the patterns and use them to illustrate three paper origami stars. All right. Now, if you never made these, that's okay. Um, I don't know if I ever did. I know I had friends that knew how but there's a cute little uh, origami project that requires two pieces of paper and if folded correctly, they create a little four pointed star. So what I've given you here to start with is four um, squares. 
In order to turn this into the shape of that origami star, we're going to actually have to change the location of a couple of the anchor points. So I want you to grab the upper left anchor point of our light gray square here and the bottom right anchor point. So we're going to shift and select that with hockey A. So they're the only two anchor points selected. And then we're going to hit scale. And we're going to drag our cursor out. We're dragging until this looks to be about 45 degrees instead of 90. That looks about 45 degrees to me. So now we're going to do the same thing with the lower left corner, the upper right corner of our dark gray boxes. So I'm going to hit S for scale. And these ones I want to drag vertically. S for scale, I'm going to drag them vertically. Remember, look for about 45 degrees from where it used to be. So instead of being flat horizontal, it should be about halfway between horizontal and vertical. Right, now, if this looks a little familiar, it looks more like a pinwheel, that's what we're going for. All right. Now, in the origami sense, this piece of paper will exist here and here, which is why it's going to contain the same pattern. And then this piece of paper exists here and here, which is why it's going to contain a different pattern. We're going to make three different origami stars, so each one has the, the combo of two. So we have our shapes ready. What we haven't done is gotten to our pattern making and kind of putting it off. Let's start though. So this one we know is going to be our grid pattern. And it's going to have, you can even see it barely displayed by Illustrator there where the grid actually is. It's going to have um, a big purple shape, this dark purple shape, and then some lighter purple and blue striping on top of it. So let's start with that purple shape. Um, I want everybody to start with a square. So hockey M, I want you to hold down shift while you draw a square. Next, I want you to use your eyedropper tool to go ahead and change that to that purple. That dark, dark purple, the darkest one on our piece of paper there. And then hit R for rotate. Now I want you to hold down shift as you rotate that square so that it jumps to that 45 degree angle. Once you have rotated at 45 degrees, I want you to select just the top anchor point and hit delete. There's a reason for all this, I promise. With this piece of path selected, so we have our two top anchor points in our bottom, I want you to duplicate. So you're going to hold down you're going to start clicking and dragging the object. Then you're going to hold an option to duplicate it and shift so that the duplication stays vertical. I can't drag it just a pixel or two to the side. It's going to keep it nice and vertical. So I'm going to let go of my click before I let go of my option keys and my shift keys. Next, I'm going to connect these two pieces of path with my pen tool. So hockey P for pen. And when I hover over an open anchor point, it will give me that kind of forward slash icon. I want to do that to both sides. See, it's kind of like chevron shape. All right, I know I need, looks like two cold purples, one warm purple, and one blue stripe. Let's Let's very first, let's make sure that this is going to be tall enough to house all of that. I don't know if I made it tall enough. So I'm just going to grab the top three anchor points and then move them with my direct selection tool, hockey A. Hold down shift so that I just move them vertically. I think that's enough space. All right. Let's build the big light blue bar. I'm going to do that by selecting this shape that I just made. I'm going to get a copy, Command C, Command F, and I drop that light blue. And then I'm going to use my direct selection tool to move the set, the bottom or the top set of anchor points at the same time. And holding down shift. Shift is so that I always have a clear vertical. Right, so that's that nice thick blue bar. On top of the thick blue bar is that little thin cold purple. So let's actually just go ahead and Command C, Command F, and we'll move anchor points. I drop that purple so we can finally see it. Move that 
down. Kind of have that thin bar. Oops. Make sure I grab the whole thing when I decide to move it. Holding down shift a lot here. I'm constraining a lot of things to be vertical. Right next, I have kind of like a medium sized cold purple bar. So I'm gonna just duplicate the one I just made up above my blue stripe. And then I need to move the top three anchor points to make that a little bit thicker. It seems lastly, I need my thin warm purple. I'm gonna borrow my th I'm gonna borrow the shape of my thin chevron. Hold down Option and Shift so I duplicate it. And then I drop that warm purple. All right, so we did most of this just by creating one shape, one chevron shape, and then duplicating it and just moving pieces and parts to keep all of our lines parallel and all of our sides vertical. So next, our step is to select all these objects that we just created and drag them into our swatches palette. Let's double click on that swatch once we've deselected our objects. And look how close we are. All we have to do is change the height of our tile. So I'm gonna click in here and use my scroll wheel to bring those closer together. And then, let's see, I can name this Chevron. Oops. And we'll keep it as grid, because grid was the default, and that's what we were after. And hit Done. Now if we wanted to, we could create a whole new square filled with that pattern. We would cover up our old one. If it's not quite the same, that's okay. We're supposed to be pretty close. Maybe not perfect. Okay. One down, two to go. This pattern is made up of two circles and two rectangles. And I know that, but maybe you're starting to be able to put that together. All right, so our first circle is gonna to need to be this color, this orange. Use L for ellipse and create a little orange circle. Now my next circle is going to be red, so I'm going to have to I'm going to hit Command C, Command F, I drop the red, and then switch to my hotkey V so I have a bounding box, and make that larger before sending it back behind that first circle with hot, my hotkey brackets. Now remember when you use Option as a modifier, it will grow or shrink or rotate or scale an object from its center outwards. So you don't end up with circles that don't share the same center. We don't. We want the circles to share the same center. All right. Next, we have a red bar. So I'm just gonna put a red bar here and move it behind my circles. Now I want to make sure that my circles and my bar all share the same mathematical center. So I'm going to select all of them here Oops, with my selection tool, hotkey V. And then once I have more than one object selected, I actually do get my alignment tools that show up here on the top of my control bar. And they allow me to align multiple shapes to either a far left, a far right, a center, uh, maybe that's vertically, maybe it's horizontally, maybe top, bottom, etc. But I want both my vertical center and my horizontal center to be the same for all those objects. And I think I'll just duplicate this bar, Command C, Command F. I drop the orange, and make it kind of big and send it backwards so that I've got something to start with. I know I can edit this later. All right, so two rectangles, orange, red, two circles, red, orange. I think I need to make my inner circle a little bit smaller to kind of match the width of the bar. Yeah, that I needed to make my bar thinner. Either way, once you've finished all those adjustments, let's bring those objects into your swatches palette, create a new pattern. We'll deselect the objects so that we don't fill them with the pattern by accident, and then double click on our pattern to edit it. All right, so this one is gonna be a brick by 
row pattern. And I think we just need to change the height of our tile again. We just need to make it a little bit narrower. So it's just a little bit closer. Now if we start to get that overlap, we know what to do. We're going to move that rectangle up and to the left so that it doesn't overlap things. I'm going to call this one, I don't know what to call this one, chain. And then we'll hit done. Now if we draw a new square, it will fill with that pattern that we just created. So you can see with very few objects you can create a nice interesting pattern. All right, last one, hexagon. It looks like honeycomb. Let's start with our polygon tool. All right, now if you haven't used a polygon tool in a while, it'll probably populate with a hexagon. Now remember to change that. You can always hit your up or down keys until you get the appropriate amount of sides. We need six. And also we need to be holding down shift so that it comes in with a nice flat horizontal bottom and top. Remember to let go of your click before you let go of your modifying keys like shift and option. That way that uh, you don't lose that modification at the very last second and it jumps to its you know old stretch. All right, so this is a series of one, two, so this is three hexagons and then a piece of a hexagon. That's a stroke. The first hexagon color is this background orange. The second hexagon, so we'll get Command-C, Command-F, is the yellow. And then we'll shrink that hexagon down, holding down Shift and Option. The next one is this kind of uh, warm, light orange. So we have Command C, Command F, and undrop that color, and go ahead and shrink that down as well. All right, last but not least, we have a little piece right here that has the same angles of the hexagon. So we're actually going to start with a full shape and delete some pieces out. So we're going to get Command C, Command F again. So I drop the yellow. And we'll shrink it down, holding down Shift and Option. And then we're going to select, using our Direct Section Tool, Hotkey A, these three anchor points. So we just have this one. And there we'll change our fill to our stroke, so we can hit Shift X, and that will change your fill to your stroke. And we've got some widgets to work with here. We're also going to change the stroke to have rounded ends. Right now it's got the square ends up here to our stroke palette. If you don't have that stroke window stroke palette, go ahead and get it. Hit the drop down menu window and down to stroke. All right. With it selected, I'm going to go ahead and give it round caps. And then we're going to use that widget tool. We're not going to use it on our outermost orange because uh, we don't want there to be little gaps in the middle of our tiles, but we'll use it on our yellow hexagon and our little light orange hexagon. And then just on the corner, the inside corner here, that little yellow shape. I think I need this needs to be a little bit thicker. Yeah, it's a little thicker than I wanted. You know what, really honestly, I think what I don't like about it is that it comes so close to this corner. So I'm gonna add an anchor point or just a little further inside. I'm just gonna minus anchor point to the end. So I'm going to add one a little further inside and move my minus. There we go. That's what was feeling cluttered about it. All right, so with one, two, three hexagons and then a piece of another, we'll go ahead and select these objects and click and drag them into our swatches palette. Deselect the objects, double click our swatch to edit it, and we'll change this to hex by column. I think that just does it. I think that's it. We'll just call it honeycomb and hit OK. And we'll give ourselves a nice new square here. Oops, it's got a pattern or something in the stroke. Make it fun.
Okay. We now have our three paper patterns for our origami. We're going to need, let's start with one ninja star and see how it goes. All right, so for this first ninja star, let's go ahead and make our opposite pieces, our opposite corners, our first piece of paper color. All right. Second set, that orange, the orange chain pattern. Now, by the time that um, you've folded this paper, it's probably not going to be perfectly vertical or horizontal anymore, the pattern. Um, so what I want us to do is to kind of create a little bit of organic nature to this in that I want to rotate each one of these patterns, not the objects, just by like a degree or two. Maybe two is just too unnoticeable. Oh, it's not working. I must not have the whole thing selected. One second. There we go. Sorry if that happened to you too. My apologies. I didn't have the whole object selected at once. So about four degrees, one direction, and maybe I'll select the other one and rotate it. Uh, the negative direction, negative, negative two. And what that's going to do is just going to kind of break it out of accidentally being a little bit too stiff, a little bit too vector. Um, Illustrator is famous for things looking just a little bit too manufactured. So any way that you can kind of push it to be more organic is pretty good. So I just did the opposite of those two. All right, next, I want the pieces of paper to be casting a small shadow on each other where they've folded over. All right, I'm going to accomplish this with a very small shape. Let's get my pen tool. And I'm going to make a very small shape that starts out with a straight line and then kind of has a little teeny curve under the bottom. Now this is going to autofill with my pattern. I'm going to change this to be uh, black, a black fill. I used my swatches to do that because there was just a very handy swatch for it. And then I'll change the transparency of that little shape to be about 30, 35%. Opacity. So we're seeing through this black shape to the pattern below it. And I'm going to do that again. Oops, I need to go this way. Because all these are kind of overlapping each other just a little bit. Maybe just the blue is overlapping the orange. I think I'm just going to do this like a pinwheel. Each one gets its own corner. I'm using my eyedropper tool to eyedrop that black with the uh, transparency information from the shape that I made so I don't have to go back to the transparency palette every time. All right, so I get that fun little fold. Each one. So not only is each one rotated a little bit to feel natural, but now each one is casting a teeny tiny little shadow, which gives it a teeny bit of dimension. All right. Next, I want to go ahead and copy my my group here, Control C, Command F. I'm actually gonna use my Pathfinder Mode Unite. I'm gonna make one shape out of them. I'm gonna change it to be that shadow color. Sorry, I dropped that black. So all I have now is just a shape that is the total sum of those four. This is a pinwheel. I'm gonna move it slightly to the right and below the pinwheel. I'm gonna use my bracket keys, Command Shift, close the bracket, to send it all the way to the back. This is just a little trick because we're going to try to make it look a little bit like a, a photograph. But we want to give it a cast shadow. And we want the edges to be diffused. So this is something that we did just a little bit um, with some of our effects. We're going to come up here to window, or excuse me, effect, stylize, and we're going to feather it. We're going to kind of make the edge. Oh, that's way too many pixels. Let's try two pixels. That's not enough. Let's try six pixels. Six pixels feels pretty good. Maybe eight? We're getting close. Ah, I'm going to do eight pixels. So what it does is it kind of softens that edge a little bit, makes it feel more like a cast shadow. Maybe eight wasn't enough. 
Maybe I'm being just a little crazy. All right, we're gonna keep it at eight and then we're gonna rotate the object just ever so slightly like the light is hitting one corner or one corner is closer to our surface than the other. So again, it's one of those like little things that just adds up to uh, feeling a little more natural. All right, now with those four little shadow shapes created and our shadow shape added, I wanna group all these together. So we can select all the objects there hit Command G. Then all we're gonna have to do is just copy this twice over and use the other combos of paper that we created. So pinwheel one, we rotate the whole thing a little bit too, so it's just not vertical. Pinwheel two, so I'm holding an option and shift to duplicate it. And pinwheel three. And pinwheel two, we're gonna use hotkey A to select. Let's see, we'll change our two oranges to be our honeycomb. And then in pinwheel three, we'll change our two chevrons to be honeycomb. So we have the three total possible combos of these paper used for this origami star. All right, that was a lot. I hope you love the pattern tool. It is so much fun to use. And it honestly, it saves Illustrator a lot of memory. Um, you could use 500 hexagons to create a visual pattern, um, but it is so much easier for Illustrator to just remember just a few shapes and know how to repeat them in, with a tile. Um, so this is something that's incredibly useful um, in so many different ways, ways that I won't even know until I try. Um, but I hope you find some really great ways to use them in your illustrations. All right, if I don't see you in a Lab 7, I'll know why. <laughs> Have a good one.